I first met cryptography when I was 10 in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And our teacher taught us a day and a half about cryptography. And I, I had an interest in the subject that lasted about two weeks. I got my father to bring me books on the subject. Yep. Um, I was never able to read the one serious book he read. I haven't read, he brought it, I haven't read it yet. And that's Gaines <laughs> Cryptanalysis, which is a, not the kind of thing I'm likely to get into. That's not, it's very tedious, all these complex classical systems and how to break them. Mm -hmm. But I, I formed in two weeks the impression that a transposed visionaire system was the, you know, was the answer and, mm -hmm. and left the matter. Um, and every now and then I got reminded of it. So I remember being, you know, being told at MIT that uh, Andy Gleason had done important work in cryptography, and later I learned more about that and met, talked to Gleason and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that the way modern systems work was to XOR a keystream with the uh, with with the data with the plain text stream. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> once again, for quite a while, I thought. I knew all I needed to about the subject. In the summer of 1972, there was just a lucky accident for me. Larry Roberts, who was funding the ARPANET, mm -hmm. went up to NSA to visit uh, Howard Rosenblum, who was the deputy director for research, with the obvious proposition, look, I have a $100 million a year military communications research project. We should th consider issues of security. And I can't imagine they disagreed on that, <laughs> but they couldn't come to an agreement because Roberts didn't want to fund any secret work and Rosenblum didn't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. So Roberts has this wonderful job, right? He sits in his office in Roslyn and his principal investigators come by with their hats in their hands and they have to listen to whatever he wants to talk about. <laughs> and that week he talked about, no, what he, we thought of then as network security, yeah. right? And we thought of network security at the time as cryptography. And he got my boss, John McCarthy, head of my laboratory, yeah. came by. And he got interested in it, and he came back out to the lab and chatted us up about it. And in my case, that didn't do him so well, because I got interested, and this time it stuck. And six months later, I was working on nothing else. And he was fed up to his back teeth, because I was being supported by NSA to work on proof of correctness. Right. right. <laughs> uh, the money was laundered a little. It went through the Navy or so, something. Right. But, but um, uh, our, actually, uh, the, um, I want to say case officer, but that's the spot. A person came from NSA and chatted with us every now and then about what we were doing. Yeah. So at any event, in the spring of 1973, uh, John and I came to a, a friendly separation. I took... Uh, quote, an indefinite leave of absence, but it turned out to last only a year. Mm -hmm. Suddenly a year later, I got a, a check for several thousand dollars and uh, uh, so long, fat-ass letter. <laughs> and uh, I have no idea whether I would have gotten involved with the lab again if I hadn't. But um, So I went off planning to travel around the world, but started, we started driving around the U.S., you know, digging up digging up hard to find documents, yep. talking to anybody willing to talk, and sitting in lots of places, you know, congenial circumstances and just working on these problems. And uh, I visited people at universities and uh, And my around the world plan was interrupted by meeting Mary Fisher, mm -hmm. whom I call my first discovery. Without her, that, I wouldn't have discovered anything else. She really played a mm. central role um, in my life. And we were together from then until she died five years ago. Um, and in the second year of this traveling, well, we, we ended up, we came back to California in November. And when we stayed for months with Les Lamport. Mm -hmm. And then we went off again. And I think it's that trip, we went to Yorktown Heights. IBM Watson Research Lab, yep. which had the only real cryptographic laboratory outside the government at the time. Mm -hmm. And I went, I wanted to meet Horst Feistel, but he had left already. He, he always liked Cape Cod. He went up He went up for the weekend to Cape Cod, so it must have been a Friday afternoon. And I got to talk to his boss, Alan Conheim, 
And Alan Kahnheim was very secretive, and he only told me one thing, and, this, and after that he wished he'd never said that. And the one thing was, two people can work on a problem better than one. I can't tell you about any of this stuff. My old friend Marty Hellman is interested in this. You should go look him up. All right. I went back to the West Coast, and yeah. uh, I remember calling down from Oakland to Stanford, and uh, Marty graciously granted me half an hour of his time <laughs> on some, <laughs> some, some weekday afternoon. I don't remember now. You know, it may be the old, no, old little notebooks like this, the sort that I carry. You know, yeah. My files would tell me exactly what day, but I haven't tried to find it. Um, so we drove down there, and Mary took the car and went off, and I... She knew better than to call in half an hour. She called at six. <laughs> it started at four thirty. She called at six, and Marty invited the two of us to dinner. And we went over to. So she came by and collect me, and we went. We went to his place, and as families, we all got along well. Mm. And uh, in particular, Marty's mother-in-law raised dogs. And Mary, Mary could recognize 200 breeds of dog at a glance. She, she, she was, so we, uh, that was uh, what got, got us started. Yeah, and the rest is history, as they say, I guess, <laughs> right? <laughs> Brilliant, what well, a great story. And there's a few things there that, that kind of jumped out at me. When you mentioned you were sort of, traveling around, meeting people, talking to people, did you find or do you find that you do, like that's your sort of best work environment to be constantly moving, meeting new people rather than like staying in one place? And Well, because it's then and now, I don't have right, the energy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that very much at the time. Yeah, okay. In principle, I probably like it now. I can go through, you know, we often weeks, uh, I've done a lot of it since, not of quite the same thing, mm. but driving around, staying with people on the East Coast, sort of back and forth between Washington and Boston. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have friends and colleagues in all those yeah. places. Um, and what was... You're bringing me to a point that what is, I think, unique about my working technique um, is that it combines repertorial style of going and interviewing people, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And thinking about the problems directly. Yeah. And so uh, lots, of, lots of people who've done good work in cryptography have never looked at anything except what appeared in the academic literature. Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I, I remember driving a woman from Princeton to New York and she, no, she, she didn't know what a rotor machine was. Right, I mean, it's sort of explaining how devices before computers worked. Yeah. She never paid any attention to that. And lots of people, even even if they knew something about that, weren't interested in in learning anything secret. Yeah. Uh, and I I had no I, I my attitude was this was very important technology. NSA knew knew a lot about it and wasn't telling us, and we had to figure it out. <laughs> and yeah. figuring it out was one element, but you know. I learned. I spent a long time studying military regulations, mm. which let you in at the at the edges. You know, it's very interesting. The things get published because people need to publish them. Yeah. And uh, there's an interesting article in uh, NSA Technical Journal from years ago. That's an analysis of Russian. Uh, emissions standards and okay. how they vary between communications equipment and other things, right? So you have to know if the Russian communications standards had to be public. You have to tell people yeah. how to build yeah, yeah, equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they don't have to be as public as they would have to be in the U.S., but, mm. but uh, they, I think these were not, uh, they just didn't say why they said things. Yeah. And, you know, you can find how many key bits algorithms have and things from what the interfaces to them are. And they, uh, so I was, I did that kind of thing. Right. And anybody I could find, I thought knew something, I, yeah. uh, I, 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 you know, I looked them up. If they talked to me, I talked to them, so. It sounds like almost being like a detective. Yeah, no, yeah. it's, it, well, been. I call it repertorial rather right, than detective. But, okay, but, but yeah. it's, um, and. So, I mean, there's some intermediate, uh, another area, which is outright historical work. Uh, I spent the first year of this 
the main thing I did was to read David Kahn's 1,200 pages right. very, very carefully. Uh, I'm ashamed to say I missed an important detail that James Bamford noticed. Uh, there, was a, there was a little bit of censorship in Kahn, and mm. Bamford, it, you know, produces an inconsistency between the text and the notes, and Bamford found it and I didn't, and I was much chagrined by that fact, <laughs> even though the detail was not of any importance to my direction. Mm. Uh, has to do with weak crypto systems being used by African countries or something of that right. kind. Um, so that's, that's maybe the environment in which I'm most productive. Yeah. Um, but the environment in which I, you know, did the one good hour of work that I've been making a living off of <laughs> the last 50 years was living at John McCarthy's house. And this is one type of example of how valuable Mary was <clears throat> because John invited the two of us to take care of his daughter while he went off to Japan. Right? Right. Much as he trusted me, he might well have been hesitant to invite a guy by himself to take care of so. mm -hmm. His daughter was nothing to be taken care of except to be driven places. She was 13, <laughs> she couldn't drive. Right? But, um, so I had, I had his, his, his house and he had a home terminal, which was a rare thing at that time. Right. So I had a lovely working environment to sit and work in. And uh, so you could say, you know, that's the, uh, that's the best. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it was more than one hour, <laughs> even if you no, well, think it was. No, there's a, one moment. Yeah, there's, yeah. It's, there's one, you know, moment at which I, okay. I saw, I had, I, had, I had figured out the notion of signature. Uh -huh. And the way I figured it out in the format, that means that if you turn it around, you get, get key exchange. Mm. Key exchange. So that... Um, <clears throat> That was that was the, uh, and at that that in that moment I had solved the problem that I'd been thinking about for ten years. Yeah, I'd only been thinking about signature for five years. So I think of that. I lots of people now. I think I may be coming convinced. You know, are of the opinion that uh, signature is more important mm -hmm. uh, than than the key negotiation, but uh, at the time, I found. I found the the public key property the most you know the the most wonderfully thing you wouldn't have thought you could do, do and yeah. somehow once you understood it it was obvious you could do it. I think that's how the best ideas go. As soon as you have them or you figure out, you're like, well, that was obvious all along, right? Like, well, I think that's probably I, I'm not sure that's true of everything. I mean, but I don't know. I'm going to. I, I mean, I think there are really interesting things that are no sense obvious. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Fine. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never not understood not. general relativity. Yes. Uh, okay. I agree. That, I, is that, not that takes some yes. real work. To, yeah. To, yeah. Uh, that that is not obvious. But I, I think agree. I think I'll tell you what I think is really is sort of of this kind. I know. I I think every young scholar should should read a Watson's book, Double Helix. And you see, the two very smart guys worked two years on something that they knew Shagroff's rules, they knew the diameters of the molecules, and it took them two years to figure out that the reason there's always the same amount of adenine and thymine is that they're always bonded together. Right? That, that yeah. seems in retrospect, you know, you should kick yourself. <laughs> and so, but it's important to, to read that and to understand that you know, when, when you've been thinking about something forever and you can't yeah. get anywhere, you just keep on thinking. You, there's... Mm.